Hey folks, my name is Will Jarvis. Along with my dad, Dr. David Jarvis, we record the podcast Narratives. Narratives is a project exploring stories about progress. In what ways are we better off now than in the past? Are there ways that we are worse off? What is the ideal future? How do we build it? Join us as we explore these questions with some of the brightest minds in the world. Hey folks, a bit of a shorter episode this week. We had some technical difficulties that prevented us from getting our usual longer episode out. We'll be back to our regular format next week, and we've got some really interesting guests lined up. If you get a chance, we'd really appreciate it if you gave us a review slash subscribe on your preferred platform. Here's the tape. So we wanted to get started today with a little story about Hurricane Fran. Do you remember Hurricane Fran? I do. So, um, I barely remember Hurricane Fran. I remember not being able to watch television, which was quite distressing at that age. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Fran? Um, one I remember more than anything about Fran was lots of water. Pretty bad. Everywhere. Pretty bad. For a long time. And it did disrupt everything. And, uh, and... The other thing I remember about Fran were the helicopters going over to rescue people. That's the other thing I remember. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Power's out for quite a while. Yeah. Probably two weeks. Was it two weeks for us? Uh, anytime it's over a week, it sounds it seems like forever. It all runs together. Because, you know, the other thing about hurricanes, it seems like it's always hot and humid after a hurricane. I remember it was hot. <laughs> I remember being hot. Um so I get the story from Mike Munger. Mike Munger is an economist at um, Duke University. I believe he's actually a political scientist, but he's trained as an economist. He ran for for lieutenant governor, I believe, a couple of years ago. Very interesting guy. But we have a story today about government interventionism, about the government trying to improve outcomes by interfering with the price mechanism. So in during Hurricane Fran... There were a couple of enterprising blokes, we'll call them, from Goldsboro, North Carolina. Can you tell us where Goldsboro is? Oh, Goldsboro is, oh, you would say Wilson's probably 30 minutes south of here, and Goldsboro is probably 30 minutes south of Wilson to the southeast a little bit. Yeah. That's right. And just to note, if you, so this is in eastern North Carolina, if you broke up North Carolina from 40, from, sorry, not 40, from Raleigh, East, if you broke that off and made it its own state, that would be the poorest state in the United States. Wow. Pretty interesting. So there was a couple of blokes from Goldsboro, and they heard that there was no power in Raleigh because of Hurricane Fran. So they decided to load up their truck with ice, you know, big old pickup truck, just load it up. And they thought there was an arbitrage opportunity, right? They had a huge amount of ice in Goldsboro. And they knew there were a lot of people in Raleigh that needed ice for all kinds of different things. You know, they wanted cold drinks. It was hot. It was just after a hurricane. Keep insulin cold. There's plenty of essential uses we can think of of ice. So they drove to Raleigh. It's about, what, 60, 90 miles? Yeah, it took an hour, hour and 15 probably an hour. minutes probably. Maybe a little bit longer to Goldsboro or something. Yeah, probably would. Hour and a half. Yeah. Right. So they make it to Raleigh. And, you know, they stop in a parking lot and they start selling ice. So they're selling ice for about $11 a bag. And how much is a bag of ice usually? You know, dollar and a half. A dollar right? and a half, right. Yeah. So, you know, pretty significant um, difference from usual. But it's a crisis. They had to drive from Goldsboro. And there was people lined along the block to buy the ice. Everybody wanted the ice for $11 because they were the only people that were able to provide it at the time. Now, it's important to note people are not very happy about paying $11 a, uh, a bag of, um, for a bag of ice, which plays into our story a little bit. In North Carolina, it's actually illegal to do this. When there's a state of emergency, and Dad, can you talk a little bit about the specifics of that? You can't charge more than an X premium on any essential good. Yeah, if the governor declares an emergency, 
you can't charge more than 10% for something that you normally, then you would normally charge. Right. So this is the same sentiment as people being mad paying for the exorbitant price of ice. So they start selling ice and someone decides to call the police, right? Because it's clearly price gouging. The police come, they arrest the blokes from Goldsboro. They put the truck in impound and the rest of the ice melts. So we have a big puddle of water. We have a big puddle of auto water, no ice for anyone who needs it to keep their insulin cold, for example, baby formula cold. Or cool their beer down. Or cool their beer, most importantly, yes. Let's not forget that. So why is this story important? Uh, the the story is important about uh, concerning uh, whether interventionism actually works. Did that work to shut them down? So now we have no ice, right? We have no ice. So we have no ice. This is really interesting to me, right? Because if you, you and I were in that line, we would probably be cheering that the police officer yeah. had come and arrested these guys. You know, these, these oh man, these guys, as big as butts, <laughs> trying to take advantage of a bad situation. Now, the real problem here, though, is that if we don't allow price gouging, if we don't allow the price mechanism to work, there is no ice. So the question is, is what do we do in this situation? Do we allow there to be price gouging laws and not have ice in a crisis? It's a great question. And, and, and it, it, one of the things is, as you sort of take a deeper dive in this, that you realize is, first of all, this is a transient situation, right? right. It's only going to happen for a little bit. That's correct. It makes something available you wouldn't otherwise have. Right. And there are extraordinary measures you have to go to to supply it so correct so the the it, it the the specific commodity that you're talking about is worth more there's no question that's true right there's scarcity like that so it becomes a question of how much more it's worth and whether you really want it right so this is, this is very interesting to me this is one of my favorite examples of interventionism and the price mechanism interventions in the price mechanism as mises would say because everyone ends up better off if they sell the ice and they buy the ice in free exchange. But people are very mad about this. They're v- we would be very mad. You and I, we're very rational about this. I, I'm sure, I assure the listener, we're very rational. We would not be happy with paying $11 a bag of ice. We would be mad about it. Th- this kind of reminds me of, let's say you and I were walking down the road and I spot a dollar bill in, let's say, in pennies. There's 100 pennies. And I snatch it up. And we were walking around the same route. We saw it about the same time. I just bent down and picked it up. Picked it up. Imagine if I gave you um, one penny of that 100 I picked up. How would you feel about that? I'd feel cheated. Feel cheated. Even though you're better off than you were 10 seconds ago. There, there's something... Something about fairness that's kind of internal to people. And, and I, this is why I don't blame people for, for being, um, let's say, pro the kinds of interventions we just talked about, like anti-price gouging. It makes sense, right? There's a, it, it, morally, we have a moral intuition that that's wrong. But it does make us worse off at the end of the day. And there's all kinds of s- stories like that we tell ourselves where things are bad when in reality we end up better off at the end of the day. It has, a, I think that it speaks a lot to what we expect of government and we expect them to react to our emotional outburst. That's right. Which is not a great way to go about things. That's what sells things. I mean, at the end of the day. Yeah. Cause the, the lack of logic then means you actually get along worse. That's right. That's right. At the end of the day. Because if you think about it, if the guys from Goldsboro had been allowed to sell the ice for $11 a bag and guys from Kinston that Decided, were there found out about it, said, right. hey, we'll go and we'll sell it for $10 a bag to borrow. That's right. And then the next day, guys from Wilson or wherever is available said, you know, they sold it for 10 We can do it for 9 Within about three days, you're going to have it back to maybe... 
I don't know. If even if you were paying three dollars a bag, you would think that was acceptable. That's right. Absolutely. So very quickly, the market would adjust. That's exactly right. And I do want to note here that this is a special case. This applies to commodities, and it's perfect competition. Um, this is very easy to model, right? Most things do not fall along the lines of either extreme perfect competition. Strawberries, for example, they're all the same. You know, they'll try to tell you some are different, but they're essentially all the same. And so all the profits get competed away versus something that's very unique, a monopoly like business like Google, right? So Google's a monopoly. They have 80 some percent of the search market and they'll tell you all kinds of different things about why they're not a monopoly. It's another thing from Peter Thiel. It's like, you know, if you're a monopoly, you want to disguise that you're a monopoly. And if you're not a monopoly, you want to tell everybody you're a monopoly because all the good businesses are monopolies. So do you want to dive into interventionism and in monopolies or? Right. So this is interesting. Um, there's a lot of different ways to think about this and we could spend hours and hours talking about, um, monopolies and government interventionism into them. You know, there's some cases of monopolies where the, so this, let's just back up and say the standard in the United States is that, um, it's, it's around customer welfare. So if the customer is made worse off by a monopoly, then, um, they'll break them up. They, they have license to break up the, the, the company. Um, for example, if you and I decided, um, to go and buy up all of the chicken processing plants and farms in the United States, we had unlimited capital. We just buy them all. Um, and we raise chicken prices by 25%. Funny enough, there's this whole, there's a question about whether or not the chicken companies collude. There's a lawsuit. The people I know in the chicken industry swear this doesn't happen. There's a, we, we can discuss that later, it's, it's, but it's interesting. So let's say we're selling chickens. Um, so the customer is worse off at the end of the day. They're getting the same quality chicken. They're paying 25% more. Under that case, it's very likely the SEC would come and break us up. There are other monopolies, though, that seem to give us plenty of advantages, right? So let's say um, Google, for example. There, there's a concept um, in Slate, Slate Star Codex post about this recently. It's, about, it's called Slack. So Slack is something... Let's imagine some, something with intense competitive pressure. So that would be like fitness for um, organisms, you know, millions of years ago. So there's intense competition for a limited amount of resources, food or sunlight, energy. How in the heck would you ever develop eyes? Think about that. Think about how complicated an eye is. So you need some something to pull back on you know, evolutionary pressure to allow something complex to develop. So that's one sense in which monopolies, like a monopoly, would give you some respite from competition to actually build something. Because if you're competing all the time, all the profits are getting competed away. It's very difficult to ever really move the needle on innovation and things like that nature. So that's a more complicated case of monopoly, right? Um, so, the, you know, we, we talk of these polarities because... It's easy. You know, we have the, the customer um, satisfaction experience standard where things are a lot, if it's a lot worse for the customer, we know that's bad. That's clearly bad. That's easy to work with. What about Amazon? Okay, Amazon is becoming, it is clearly kind of a monopoly. It, it depends about how you look at it, right? So they're a marketplace and they sell goods in that marketplace. That's kind of a problem. You know, some people say that's a problem. Well, the customer's better off at the end of the day. They're paying less. The question is, that is that a good thing? Is that standard still enough, or is there a problem with it? So is it going to depend on how many compl people complain, whether we break up Amazon? That's right. I think that's a, that's a big, big factor in that, right? Um, I think the customer standard, customer welfare standard, excuse me, is probably enough. I think that makes... Intuitively, that makes sense to me. I do understand why, you know, there's plenty of small businesses that, um, that hate this, right? So if you sell a piece of luggage, you and I, Will and, and David's 
you know, luggage, you know, luggage company. We're selling luggage. It's awesome. It's a pretty good price. You know, people love it on Amazon. Amazon looks at it and they go, hmm, that would make a great Amazon basics item. And then they start producing it. They outsource it to China. You know, they're making it for a tenth of what we could ever imagine making it for. They've got almost unlimited capital to do so compared to us. And they outcompete us and we go out of business and our product's gone. Now that's, that sounds pretty bad, right? Now for the customer, it could be better. They could, you know, charge, you know, three quarters of the price we charge. They save money. They get the same item. It's a toss up, right? It, it, you know, it's a great question. It leads me to, to ponder a lot. What are the driving forces that force monopoly like structures to be, um, compelled to stop doing what they're doing because people made the same complaints about Walmart because they put so many small businesses right. out of business. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's a problem, right? So yes. So, so we go back to, so Walmart, you know, famously destroyed all the small town, you know, downtown stores, which funny enough, I don't know if you've driven through small towns recently. I don't know how this, well, this holds up with COVID anymore, but surprising resurgence right of all these small downtowns goldsboro funny enough it's kind of it's cute fountain north carolina there's even stores anywhere you go um this kind of reurbanization has been happening uh but it's all boutique stores it's all unique angles to, they survive to the extent that they're actually unique um at the end of the day walmart provides very low prices to, in consumer so they benefit with that but there are trade-offs on the other end as well. And something important to think about that. And maybe that's the natural evolution of economics is that, you know, the big box like Walmart comes in, a lot of places go out of business. But then people find special things that they need that Walmart doesn't supply. Right. And so businesses start to supply the things back in the same spaces sometimes. When right. small businesses fail, new small businesses come along and succeed because they can do something different that Walmart can't do. That's right. Okay. Cool. I think I think I intervened enough in that one. That's good. Awesome. Well, thanks. We look forward to seeing you guys next week. <laughs> well, that's our show for today. I'm Will Jarvis. And I'm Will's dad. Join us next week for more narratives.